it's interesting where we can go through these periods of feeling like we're fine and we don't have any issues, but actually deep within us, there are these traumas that are just waiting to come out at some other point in life. All right, so this episode is all about burnout, the society that we live in, the overstimulation that we get from the phones and from social media and from our work and this constant desire to be constantly on and never really switching off. And so today's guest is very fun because his name is Hector Hughes and he basically specializes in helping people do digital detoxes. He had his own experience of burnout and now he built this company that helps people unplug and go off the grid. The difference between people when they checked in and checked out was crazy. They looked 10 years younger. Not only do you kind of change your perception on that, but you also get all the benefits of the kind of deep sense of calm and relaxation. I went to one of their cabins in the woods about a year ago and TBH, I didn't take it seriously and I just sort of still had my phone and stuff but now half of my team have done this cabin in the woods detox thing and they all swear by it and so one of my action points from this episode is to actually you know just try and go somewhere and turn my phone off for like three days and just see what happens you could ask yourself a more neutral question which is like how, how am I really feeling you know like how am I doing if the answer is not good then you know perhaps it's time to change Hey friends, so before we get into the episode, I've got some very exciting news that I'm finally able to share with you, and that is that I have written a book. Now, if you've been following the podcast for a while, you'll probably know from some of my conversations with authors in particular that it's been quite the journey over the last three years. This has been the single hardest thing that I've ever done in my life, but after three years, it's finally here, and I'm delighted to announce that my book, Feel Good Productivity is now available for pre-order. It's gonna be published later this year and you can find a link down in the video description or if you head over to feelgoodproductivity.com, all one word, uh, you can check out the website and the website is absolutely sick. Now, the central idea for the book came from a realization that I had while I was working as a doctor a few years ago and trying to juggle everything with my YouTube channel and my business. And I kind of realized that the secret to productivity isn't discipline, it's in fact joy. And sure, hard work and grit and willpower and determination and all of those things are good in small doses. But for most of us, they tend not to be the sustainable route to consistent productivity. But I realized through a lot of experimentation and then diving into a bunch of research that actually the secret to productivity that feels enjoyable and meaningful and sustainable is to find a way to make your work feel good, to find a way to make it feel energizing and enjoyable. And if you do that, you'll be more productive in your work, but you'll also have way more energy to give to the other things in your life that matter to you. And this isn't just my own personal experience, but it's an idea that's been validated by a bunch of studies in the fields of psychology and neuroscience as well. And so the writing process of the book over the last three years has involved reading hundreds of research papers, interviewing academics and experts in the fields of like psychology and procrastination and motivation, and spending years trying to condense it into a format and cut out all the fluff and trying to do it in a way that's like engaging and actionable at the same time. So that's what the book is about. It is a science-backed guide on how to do more of what matters to you in a way that feels enjoyable and meaningful and sustainable. And if you enjoy this podcast, then I can basically guarantee that you will love the stuff that's in the book. Uh, there are nine chapters. Each chapter has six different experiments in it that you can try out in your own life. And so there are 54 different experiments, strategies that you can apply to your life starting from as soon as you read the book. And the idea is that you apply these and you see if they work for you. And over time, you'll build your own feel-good productivity system. Now, if you do decide to pre-order the book, then that would be awesome because firstly, it helps me out. And secondly, I think the ideas in this book can be genuinely life-changing. And if you pre-order the book, it will be delivered straight to you on release date later this year, or to your Kindle or your Audible account. And I'm narrating the audiobook, by the way, uh, or to the hardback hardback version of the book if you prefer to read physical copies of books. And if you do pre-order, then please do be sure to save your receipts because I'm going to be announcing a bunch of really exciting pre-order bonuses exclusively only for people who pre-order the book. And so final thing before we get into the episode is just wanted to say a massive thank you to you guys by watching the videos, by subscribing on social media, by listening to the podcast, you have made this book possible. Um, without you guys supporting the channel and everything that I do, there's no way Penguin would have come knocking and been like, hey, do you want to write a book? And so I'm like, this has been like such a rewarding experience and I could not have come to this point without your support. So I just wanted to say massive thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. So that's it from me. Do check out the book if you like at feelgoodproductivity.com. It'll be linked down below in the podcast description and the show notes as well. But now let's get into the podcast episode itself. All right, Hector, welcome to the podcast. Ali, great to be here. So you have a personal experience with burnout. What's the, what's the story? Well, after university, I joined a, a tech startup. Honestly, it was the only place uh, I got a job. So applied to a whole bunch of places, didn't get any grad schemes. And then a friend of mine was like, oh, why don't you go try and a startup? So applied to some startups, one gave me a job and joined as employee number nine. And it was iPad till system. So if you go into a restaurant or a cafe and use an iPad for the till. And we spent the next three years doing the whole high growth, international expansion, did a whole bunch of roles during that time. Fantastic experience in many ways. Uh, but, you know, we also got 
a lot of the things wrong that startups tend to do. So the culture was a bit of a mess, product was a bit of a mess. So I just started to get more and more worn down by that experience and found that in 2019, after three years of doing that, I just started to really lose my joy for life. Mm. So, you know, started to find I was laughing less, stressed more, all of that, all of that kind of thing. And uh, I think there was just like a deep dissatisfaction because burnout can show itself in, in many different ways, right? You can have the complete, uh, you know, breakdown or, or actually there's just this kind of slow grinding down, which I think is maybe more people are experiencing and, and perhaps not recognizing that that also needs to change, right? Okay. So for me personally, in 2019, really felt like I needed to change and didn't didn't know what to do. A friend of mine recommended a silent retreat in the Himalayas, and uh, I, I I laughed it off much like much like you have. And uh, I thought, you know, I just thought it was the kind of thing that I couldn't do. You know, it's like uh, what were the guys at work think? I think I, you know, in some ways I was self assured about them, but in some ways I really wasn't. And I had this like not quite feeling comfortable with myself. So really, in hindsight, a lot of what I did was dictated by you know what other people would think, and that was just something that didn't feel accessible to me. And, uh, a couple of months went by, and you know, I, I just became more and more just just dissatisfied. And eventually, I was like, "Look, I may as well go and try it." Okay. So, September 2019, flew to the Himalayas, and it was this Buddhist temple on top of a mountain. And the best thing about it is, when you get there, they take your phone off you. You spend ten days cut off from the outside world. So, came back from that, you know, completely transformed and very cliche but quit my job a, a week later and to start unplugged which i know we can go on to talk about later down okay so what what i guess what sort of symptoms were you experiencing and what are the signs now that you've actually been working in the burnout industry i guess like what are the signs that someone watching or listening to this might look out for to test or to assess whether they are on the road to burnout or like burned out or yeah yeah so so after you know really kind of speaking to a lot of people and also reflecting on myself, I, I think what it is, you just stop feeling like yourself, you know, like th there's, we, we can all think back to when we're like feeling at our best and kind of freest and all of that kind of thing. And obviously life gets in the way, but you just feel like out of sorts, you know, you feel you wake up every day and you're not excited, you know? And I think that is, that is a big sign that you're burnt out and then that can go so much worse and you can get people who are fully you know, stressed and having a breakdown. But really, it's when you know you are not yourself and you are not your best. And I think it's so normalized these days. We're obviously going to go on and talk about phones, etc. But I think the the state that we're now in is we are permanently out of sorts. Yeah, and I think that's what we're not recognizing. So I would say that you know low key burnout is is very widespread. I would say most people are a little bit burnt out. Some people are very burnt out. Yeah, most people are a little bit burnt. Okay, out. but like. I'm going to push back on this a little bit. Surely we're waking up and not feeling excited. I imagine like most people who have jobs don't wake up feeling excited. Does that mean that they are low-key burned out or just that they don't really enjoy their job? Well, the question is, is it, do you not feel excited on Monday morning or is it, do you not feel excited every day? You know, and I think most people are just not, you know, they're just not kind of excited by life, their life. And that is, goes on for months, you know? And I think people feel you hear phrases like I'm stuck in a rut, you know? Yeah. And like, what is that? Is, do you think that's a healthy way of being? Uh, absolutely not. But I wonder if it like, I've always been a bit confused about the word burnout because to, to an extent it's become a little bit medicalized. I think the WHO is called burnout, like it's a little bit of burnout epidemic or some, some, something to that effect. And then the symptoms of burnout often overlap with the symptoms of depression and like low mood generally. But it's like, at what point is this a normal part of the human experience that like, oh, you know, I just don't enjoy my job versus, oh, this is something that I need to do something about. And I've, I've never quite understood the, the distinction and at what point someone should, I guess, intervene, if that makes sense. For sure. Well, I, one thing I would challenge there is uh, the normal human experience. And I think mm. that's changed and that's perhaps not in a healthy place right now. Um, but the other thing I would say is, is what gets you to that point of just like not being excited and being, uh, just dissatisfied with your life mm. is just a slow accumulation of stress. You know, it's an accumulation of, of things. Mm. It's not just like, hey, you're doing something you don't like, because actually when we're functioning at our best and we do something that like we don't like, then, you know, it's it's kind of obvious and we change it. But I think the what's happening slowly over time is we're just being ground down by, you know, modern society really. And yeah. 
a, a lot of people do jobs they hate for 40, 50 years. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they, maybe it's not a super stressful job, so they don't completely flame out. I think even the phrase burnout, right, is, yeah. is very... It's quite like intense. It's very, it's yeah. very intense, yeah. And so, so you think it needs to be this like complete psychotic breakdown, which obviously does happen in the extreme cases. But I think, you know, like what is a phrase, right? It, it, it's really as far as it's useful. So it's a tool. It's, it's you know, allowing us to reflect on work and yeah. how we're doing with work. And so within that, I think it's perhaps more productive to have a wider definition or a wider interpretation of it, right? Yeah, because you know, if someone goes and has a complete breakdown, then that's fairly obvious, right? But I think we need to take a wider lens of like, well, all of these people are building up this kind of stress and dissatisfaction and resentment, frankly. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is a sort of burnout. And you know, maybe it's a use, uh, maybe it's a different phrase that's needed that's less descriptive. Yeah. But uh, but I I think they need to be looked at under the same umbrella. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think the word, when I think of burnout, I think of like the <laughs> sort of like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, complete flame out, like can't move for two months kind of level of burnout. But actually, if I think to people that I know and people in my team, and sometimes maybe even me, but like we can talk about that. Um, it's, you know, there are more moments more of like micro burnout or some, yeah. so, so something to that effect that's not quite that intense, but still a minor, minor or major niggle of like, you know, just a little bit of like not enjoying things as much as I used to, or like feeling a bit like, oh, what's the point? Or feeling a bit like, yeah. And, and often, often for, yeah. it's a sign you need a break, right? And that's where it's useful because that's where it's like, look, if someone is burnt out, then they just need a break and to go and recharge and reflect, is this the right thing for them to be doing? Or, or do they just need a holiday basically? And I think it, it's that, it's, you know, when people are just feeling not themselves mm. for weeks on end. Yeah then uh, it's useful to, to bring in this lens of like, look, this person is a bit burnt out. Let's just send them away for a bit and see what happens. Yeah. So what other questions should someone ask themselves to see, to, uh, to assess whether they are like on this micro burnout path? Well, I think the big question is like, am I at my best? And if you're not, then, then why not? Uh, and do something about it because we all really should be you know, striving for our best. And as an employer, um, you know, you, you fundamentally want your employees to turn up at their best. Yeah. And so I think there's just this acceptance of like, you know, life is a bit shitty and it's okay to like feel bad all day and like that's fine because, <laughs> you know, job's tough. <laughs> and life is tough and, you know, there are, it is super challenging. Yeah. But, you know, it, it shouldn't be demoralizing and depressing uh, and so I think it's like, you know, am I enjoying this? You know, because if you're not enjoying it, then it's not sustainable. Okay. So I'm fully with you on this. Like, I think whenever, <laughs> whenever like a, a friend will, will say to me that like, oh, you know, life's a bit shitty, but that's life, right? I'd be like, dude, come on. <laughs> like, why does it have to be like this? But also then the, peop the, the, the people I'm friends with are generally the people I went to uni with who have a certain level of privilege and are, are in high paying jobs where it's easy enough for them to find another job. Like, there are tangible actions that they could take. Whereas if, for example, like I knew lots of nurses back in the day who were very burned out, but they can't just like quit their job and do a career change as easily as, I don't know, one of my finance bros working at Goldman Sachs making 150K a year. So I, how, do, how do you think about that, that side of things? 100%. So completely right. Like there is just, you know, there are just lots of people who have to do tough jobs that they hate, stressful jobs, stressful environments like being a nurse um, to make ends meet. And maybe they don't have the tools to suddenly start loving their job, but then perhaps it's not their problem, but it's the, well, it is their problem, but it, it's the employers, right? It's like you have all these people who are completely burnt out and, you know, just, just not at their best. So I think there is still a problem there. It's much harder for the person in that situation to do something because it is out of their hands to some extent. I'm not saying, you know, everyone can go and, you know, yeah, 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 slice the Himalayas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Slice the Himalayas. So it's, it's just not that <laughs> yeah. accessible, uh, both psychologically and, you know, financially and time wise. Um, like a lot of people just can't take two weeks off. And, but but there is a systemic issue there, you know, like I'm not here to kind of hypothesize about what's going on inside the, the NHS, but like the, the fact nurses are 
so stressed. And you look at lots of big companies, right? There's lots of Goldman Sachs. Um, got a lot of heat about it a couple of years ago. Like those are systemic issues inside those companies, which is very hard. Like when you have that many people, like all sorts of issues are going to fly up and it's incredibly hard to create an environment that doesn't um, encourage that. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't normalize that, you know, it shouldn't be like, okay, well, this is just fine because you're the Yeah, Yeah, exactly. exactly. So (laughs) I still think uh, that there's big opportunities to help there and to, to, you know, really get people out of that state. But, you know, I agree that it's, it's much harder for those people specifically. But that being said, you know, there is always things you can do, right? Like there's always, um, you know, you can work on yourself. There's a, there's a good, uh, slight tangent, but chess, there's a little bit, a little bit far out, but, uh, chess used to be played, um, where you always try and think what your opponent would do a few moves ahead. Right. And then in the, I think it was in the 19th century, some guy came along, it was like a child genius. And he invented this whole new type of chess, which is something called positional chess, which all the grandmasters in the world use today, which is instead of worrying too much about what your opponent's doing, you just focus on your own position. And I think that is super, um, super valuable to all of us because it's like, I think we spend a lot of time, you know, frustrated and angry and upset by what's going on outside and in the world around us. And it's actually like, if you just focus on yourself and your position and your position is your psychology, your health, all of these things. Uh, then you will turn up better for for the other things as well. So again, it's it's not it's not easy, but it's it's there. When it comes to I guess causes of burnout slash micro burnout, are there any other things that come to mind that you see with the people that you deal with, other than overstimulation? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, a huge part of it is is people, right? Like a company is just a group of people, really. And so most most problems, if not all, are people problems. And so I think a lot of burnout. Uh, when we talk about work, comes from things like feeling underappreciated or resentment or any of these things. And I think, you know, we all want to feel special. We all want to feel seen. Uh, and we all want to feel like we're doing a good job. And I think in companies today, again, you have these very systemic issues where people do feel underappreciated. Uh, they feel resentful. They feel like, you know, their boss is an idiot or their boss is an idiot. And I think when you feel like something is out of your control mm. then you get burnt out right because it, it's when things are in your control then you can do something about them and you can take action but if we feel like things are you know our life is being made miserable by this person mm. or by some person way up the organization that you can't even see then that's when a lot of resentment brews and i think that resentment is super unhealthy and, and that can definitely cause stress and anxiety and, and all of these things mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got like, um, in my, in my upcoming book, we've got three chapters, which are about overcoming burnout. And one of the, one of my theses is for this is that I, I, I think there are three, three kind of types of burnout when I did a bunch of reading of the literature and sort of thinking of, of personal experience and stuff. The first one is, um, overexertion burnout mm-hmm. where you're just sort of yeah. constantly on the move and constantly on the grind as it were and just sort of exerting yourself too much the second type is uh, depletion burnout where you've never you haven't quite taken the time to recharge your energy and I think that's the type where a holiday really helps it's like, oh I feel all, all of a sudden recharged and rejuvenated but then the third type is um, what I call misalignment burnout where everything might be fine but you're just sort of chronically over time working towards a future and is not actually particularly aligned with where you you authentically want to be. And even if from the outside life looks good and it's like you should be living the dream and stuff, when you start feeling that chronic level of like, ah, I'm not really sure what the point is, that's a sign that maybe there's some sort of misalignment between your day-to-day right now, like your current actions, and the future that you actually want for yourself, but a future that you've authentically chosen intrinsically rather than one that's been foisted upon you from the outside. Um, does that vibe with your experience at all yeah 100 percent. i think the you know what we spoke at, about earlier which is you know burnout maybe in too broad a sense is when we're not ourselves right we're not our kind of happier selves read a couple of books on happiness one was um flow by mikhail yeah. something or other yeah. me yeah. my chick sent me high 
<laughs> the one's called happiness hypothesis. I read these about the same time, yep. and they both made the point that happiness comes for them when everything in your life is aligned. You know, so what you're doing in your job, who you spend your time with, your values, etc. And so, I guess it's that sense of when you are not happy, then by definition you're unhappy, right? And so, I think misalignment really, you know, breeds unhappiness, and you know that causes the other types right like yeah either overstrained because you feel like you're trying too hard against something you know when you really love something it doesn't feel like work at all you know it feels like play and so i think those other types of burnout perhaps come from you know something being misaligned or something being wrong uh so i think that you know it, it's really just about looking at the person and it's like am i happy right now you know, is 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 that the right? Well, like I, I feel like happy ha often has like very like oh well, I'm I'm happy when I'm drinking with the boys or when I'm playing video game. Like, yeah. D well, I, I think you know, every word is different to everyone, right? And so I, I think again, it's like what's useful. And yeah. you're right, you're right. I think happy. You know, what is happiness is such a contentious <laughs> issue. Yeah, isn't I, it? I don't think we're gonna solve it in this so conversation. Perhaps <laughs> content is a better yeah. word, right? Yeah, I like content and tranquil. Yeah, as but like. Yeah, serene. Yeah, or you could ask yourself a more neutral question, which is like, how how am I really feeling? You know, like how am I doing? And if the answer is not good, then you know, perhaps it's time to change. Mm. How am I really doing? That's what like that's what Steve Bartlett likes to ask in guests. To be like, <laughs> how are you really? And then they'll just start crying. It's like, oh yeah. my god, oh my god. Well, I think I think a lot of us have that pent up emotion in us. Yeah. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Huel. I've been using Huel. I've been a paying customer of Huel since 2017, since my fifth year of medical school when I first discovered it. And basically what it is, if you haven't heard of it, is that it is a meal in a shake. It's got the perfect balance of carbs and fiber and proteins and fat, and it contains 26 different vitamins and minerals. All you do is add water or milk to the powder. Usually I use water. You can shake it up or you can blend it. I prefer to blend. And then it becomes a fantastic option if you're like me and you're kind of busy, and so you don't really have time for breakfast or lunch. My favorite version is the Huel Black Edition. It's absolutely sick. For 400 calories, 40 grams of protein for 400 calories. I'm trying to get hench and it's actually pretty hard to find something that has such a high protein content for such a low calorie trade-off. And so I really like using the Huel Black Edition to start my mornings off. It's vegan, it's gluten-free, it's lactose-free. The Black Edition is available in nine flavors. My favorite is salted caramel. And I wouldn't recommend having every single meal Huel because that gets a bit annoying after a while, but it's absolutely fantastic. It's like one of the meals of the day, especially if you're busy and you're going to kind of default to something unhealthy otherwise. It's also very affordable, so it actually works out to £1.68 per meal for a 400 calorie meal, which is just incredible value and actually way cheaper than other generic protein shakes on the market. And it saves a bunch of time because it's so quick and easy to make. And so it's particularly exciting that they're sponsoring the podcast. And actually, we had the founder of Huel, Julian Hearn, who was on the very first season of the podcast. That was a sick episode that got so many rave reviews as well. Anyway, if you're interested in trying out Huel, then head over to huel.com forward slash deep dive. And if you use that URL, A, it really helps me out. But B, you also get a free t-shirt and also a free shaker that comes with your order. So go to huel.com forward slash deep dive. That'll also be linked down in the video description or the show notes. And thank you so much, Heal, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you really want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have to put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested £100 into this thing, what would my return have been? X weeks or X months further down the line. Once you've got some comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your Trading212 account. You can use Apple Pay, like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your Trading212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. Now, if you're based in the UK, you might be familiar with the concept of an ISA, which is an individual savings account, which is basically a tax-free wrapper that you can put money in. You can put £20,000 in every year, up to £20,000, and it resets every April, and then all that money can grow, and it's completely tax-free for the rest of your life. And if you want to sign up for an ISA, you can sign up for one completely for free, also on Trading212. So if you haven't yet filled up your ISA allowance, or at least put some money into your ISA for this year, that might be a good step forward. Also, very excitingly, there's a new feature that they've added to the app, which is a daily interest on your uninvested cash. 
These interest rates may go up or down over time as the economic environment changes, but the cool thing is that you get paid out every single day if you're into that sort of thing. The app also lets you auto invest, which is a great thing because then you can automatically invest a percentage of your paycheck into the thing every month. And so if you haven't yet started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the App Store. And if you use the coupon code ALI, A-L-I, that will give you a totally free share worth up to £100. It's available on iPhone and Android, and you can check it out by typing in Trading212 into your respective App Store. So thank you so much, Trading212, for sponsoring this episode. I'm not particularly good at feeling my feelings. This is a, yeah. a, a thing that I'm working. <laughs> yeah. I had the same. Oh, okay. I had the same feedback recently. Oh, interesting. From my girlfriend. So. What was the what, what was the story? If you don't mind sharing. Um, gosh, a couple of occasions. She's she's brought it up a few times. Yeah, I think as has uh, I started seeing a therapist recently, which has been transformational. Cool. She brought up the same challenge me on the same thing. Yeah, uh, and one of my closest friends did as well. As I've heard it from a few different angles. Nice. Um, and I think people have like encouraged me to be more emotional in situations mm. and I've reflected on it and really kind of thought about it. So for example, just, just little things like, uh, my parents' cat died who I spent a lot of time with my child and I like told my girlfriend, she was like, well, you're really not emotional, are you? And, um, I don't know, like part of me like feels a little bit like I should be, you know, crying. I, you know, love the cat, great cat. <laughs> and there are, there are times when, you know, I, I do cry as well. So I think, but yeah, I think I, I have been reflecting about this. I'm like, gosh, is there something broken in me? Mm-hmm. And actually, I, I really like, again, I think Stoics get a bit of a bad reputation in society because it's like, you know, just kind of get on with it type thing. But I don't think it's about that. I think it's about reframing a situation. You know, there is good in every situation. And I think if I look at myself, when am I at my best? It's when I have that kind of, you know, glass half full mentality. I'm like, yeah, sure this is something's going wrong but like we'll learn from this you know there's a great jocko willink video where uh it's just a three minute video about good it's like you know one of his guys comes over with an issue and he's always just like well good well and and this guy's like i I know what you're gonna say to me and he's like you're just gonna say good he's like yeah well it is good (laughs) great video uh but i think that really applies where like you can have this this glass up full mentality because there is good in every situation i look at my own life and like where i've really you know got it wrong like i had i'm 28 now and had a decade from 15 to 25 when I didn't take my life too seriously i drank a lot done a lot of stupid stuff and actually it was really getting it wrong that is kind of fueling you know everything i'm doing now and, and the positive changes i've made in my life and i think if i hadn't been if i'd been a bit less stupid in those days then the reaction wouldn't have been as uh it's kind of extreme to some extent, with, with an extreme in a positive way, you know, like I've really taken the time to uh, like learn myself, you know, give myself the tools to be happy, I think, or be content, mm. be content. So yeah. Yeah. How about you? How, how does it show up? If I, I, if I ask myself, how am I really? Like my default response is just like, yep, fine. Things are, things are good. Things are great. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's, I, I, I almost struggle to, struggle to put feelings into words or to even feel the feelings at all Mm. um and this is something that i've started working on with a therapist as of this week so like three days ago i had my first like session as part of this eight week program because apparently it's really common for uh dudes in particular to be quite disconnected from bodily feelings and to just sort of live in the mind yeah sort of be a mind walking around in in a body but not really connecting with the body at all um and and so I've been trying to figure out like what are the questions that I think like asking 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 a powerful question is often the way to sort of get at truth or insight or something. And so when I ask myself, you know, how am I feeling? It's like I don't like it doesn't yeah it doesn't really register as like fine like, yeah. But like I, d- I discovered a guy called Peter Crone recently. I don't know if you come across. Oh, you'd love his yeah, yeah right <laughs> fully right up your street. Um. He is he 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 goes by uh, the mind architect. He's like this know. British guy who ended up being a celebrity personal trainer in the U.S. and flying around with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and stuff yeah. and training them. And then he trains like Olympians and stuff. And he's got like you know the physiology, physical side, but he's also done a load of spiritual stuff and un- understands like the Indian tradition of like Vedanta or whatever the hell it's called, and just combines it all into one to sort of. And his his whole thing is he. It's, it sounds a bit grandiose, but like liberates people from the shackles of their own mind. Yeah. And he does it in a very nice kind of British accent kind of way. You know, this guy in his probably 40s. 
and it's just really cool. Like there's all these epi- podcast episodes where he's 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 a guest on a podcast, and the host is like some big hench, like Jocko Willink esque character, and they, they just break down in tears because he's he asks him just like one <laughs> pointed question, and it's just yeah. so cool. Uh, why did I get onto this? Um, I got onto this because one of his questions is well, well one of his things is that life will um, life will confront you with situations and people that will reveal where you're not free. Hundred percent. So I and so I liked it. Um, so recently, in the last like two weeks, I've been asking myself the question of like, where in w- in what way am I currently not free? And that that's a great question makes me think. Oh, okay. I can think of lots of things for that. But if asked how 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 I'm feeling, I'm like fine, I guess. But how am I not free? Oh, hello. Okay, <laughs> I care too much about view counts on YouTube. I care too much. I care too much about these fucking sponsorship yeah. deadlines and like. I feel a sense of like having to jump from this thing to this thing to this thing because the calendar is always chock a block. Oh, okay, nice. But how am I feeling? I don't know. I think, I think I'm fine. <laughs> and I did a um, the, the, there's this sort of long, longevity lab in California called Everspan Life, which I ended up working with. Uh, and I had uh, so they did a load of blood tests on me, and I had you know, like last night um, I had my Zoom session with one of their doctors who was talking me through my blood results. And he was like, you know, have you got a particularly stressful job? And I was like, no, I'm ch- I'm chill. I'm a YouTuber. I can do whatever the hell I want. Yeah. And he was like, well, your stress markers are a little bit higher than we would expect. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, you know, there's this 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 one and this one and that yeah. one and this one. I was like, and he was like, has has anyone ever told you that you should take a break? I was really? like, yeah. And he was like, do you meditate at all? I was like, no. He was like, have you tried but failed? Like, yeah. And I'd really, uh, you know, even if someone asked me now, you know, do you have a stressful job? I think. Hell no! Like I make videos on the internet and do podcasts. Like my friends have stressful jobs; they're working in the in the NHS for God's sake. And yet, everyone in my life would say I should probably take a break. And if I ask myself, "Where am I not free?" I would look at the calendar and just sort of show the person the calendar. And it's weird because I have control over my time. Like I ca- I have way more control over my life than like almost anyone in the world. And yet, I've convinced myself that like I don't know. This is what I want. That I'm totally fine. But the blood markers are not are, are telling a, a, a different story. The calendar is telling a different story. My friends are telling a different story. So I think I've recently started to realize, as I say this, that like I'm probably bullshitting myself to an extent in convincing myself that Ashley, happy days, life is yeah. good. <laughs> you know, everything is awesome in the the, the the Lego Movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does any of that land with you? Hundred percent. I think I think that's a really interesting point uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, because. You know, people ask me why am I doing this, and it's very much you know I, I really care about the mission we're, we're driving, and you know I really want. I think society is a lot more malleable than we think, and we have a real opportunity to kind of change the direction of that. So I do care about all of that. But then, if I'm really being honest with myself, there is that little bit of like you know needing to show I'm remarkable, you know, and I think that's a very human thing uh, because yeah. I, I guess to, to some of your points there, like view count, etc. The question is like what's your narrative if you're not doing so well on that, right? Mm. So if you're feeling bad because, you know, the views didn't go up so much this month, or, or for me, it might be, you know, our revenue numbers or whatever it is, um, or growth of cabins, then like, what is that narrative? There is this, this like, you know, I, I don't know, this kind of frustration that we're not like showing everyone how like amazing we are or, or whatever yeah. it is, how special we are. And that there is something about being human where we just really want to feel, um, feel special. So I think, that you know that 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 question is fantastic, and it does get to the point of you know perhaps these behaviors that we are normalizing aren't as aren't as healthy as we think, and it's super interesting that you say that everyone around you would tell you that you need a holiday, but it's not something that you feel yeah. uh, and because c- I think what does it really come back to kind of like burnout, I think another loaded word that is um also at the root of pretty much everything is is trauma, right? trauma is a big one and uh i think again it's like where are our traumas and like how do they show up again trauma kind of like burnout you you picture this like car burning out and like very dramatic and like yeah. trauma you picture some terrible thing happening during your childhood and i think trauma or you know where it's relevant here is broader than that right it's like anything that happened to us as a child yeah that might have been just like one little offhand comment yep that you know for some reason made a massive effect on us uh, and that shows up all through our life. And so I actually had um, an experience about a year or two into running Unplugged, kind of like this, where I felt like I'd 
I felt like I'd cracked life. Sounds stupid to say, but you know, I was, I was kind of, uh, had really built a strong meditation habit. I was reading a lot. I was like feeling super chilled. Like, unplugged was going well. And I was like, I, I, you know, I think I've figured out happiness, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy now. And, uh, and then, you know, life, life came and, and kind of got more complicated and got more difficult and we started growing and I got into a relationship still with, uh, with Kay now he's wonderful. And that's been, but, but that has been a challenge for me because like, that's a particular area where I have trauma. So actually, uh, start of 2020, I think I did four months of something called psychosexual therapy. Oh, hello. Yeah. And What's that? that? So it's basically sex and relationships therapy. Okay. And I had up until that point, I'd never made it past two months in a relationship. So I'd always like, I'd, I'd feel this like deep sense of claustrophobia. Um, and like, you know, literally within a couple of weeks into a relationship. And then I, I just like felt it building and building and building. And then I'd have to like cut and run. And so, and then around the time of starting unplugged, I quit drinking around that time. It was the pandemic. So I was like, okay, I'm just not going to worry about relationships for a year or something. So it must have been started 2021. And uh, and then I saw listened to a podcast with a psychosexual therapist, which I'd never heard of before. And I was like, that's probably something I could do with. So I did four months of psychosexual therapy and basically got to the bottom that it was all kind of stems from like teenage anxieties around sex and just like, I think not having confidence of like how to fucking do any of it and at the age of like 14, 15, yeah. feeling like I was behind perhaps. Yeah. Um, and and that then, in hindsight, fueled the drinking. So I started drinking about the age of fifteen, and like that was almost a party trick for a decade. It was like, well, let's just see how drunk I can get, and it's funny, and you know, people seem to like me if I do that, and that kind of thing. And so I think that um, I really built a life on that kind of pretty shaky, insecure ground. So on the surface, and if you'd asked me if I was happy, then I would have told you I was happy. Yeah, and but it was built on this like escaping from my trauma and it was only kind of really sitting down and and it was actually it was only going through a couple of relationships and realizing just how and not in relationships but two months of dating realizing just how big an issue it was for me um did i kind of reflect there's an issue here so i did the psychosexual therapy a month later i met uh, Kay, my girlfriend and you know straight off the bat that was fantastic completely different i think because i had that awareness and like awareness of myself and, and like the issues of myself but then you know we, we have also been through difficult periods so started living together pretty quickly she runs a startup as well so like there's that kind of tension at times and uh and it is difficult you know it's and so it was a very humbling experience for me because i'd come from this place of like life's so easy to like oh my gosh you know, life throws curveballs and you know we're not even talking about kids all that kind of stuff i could only imagine uh, how complicated life gets once you go down that route. So I think the more, the more kind of, um, I guess, strain or, or even stimulus or, you know, things going on in your life, the more likely you are to kind of trigger one of those traumas. So it's still something I'm working on. You know, she's, Kay's great and super open about it. So we, we chat about it a lot and, you know, both doing therapy. Um, so, and, and that has been, that has been really helpful. Like I, was chatting to my therapist a couple of weeks ago and just voicing like oh gosh you know we, we kind of went through a tougher patch and i said yeah it was just this like fear of am i making a mistake or this kind of thing and she was like and i was like looking for her to be like well you know is this the right thing for you blah 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 but she was actually like it sounds like you know it's just your fear I'm like what if you just turn down your fear and just stop questioning everything and that was super empowering and i stepped away from that and it was like, oh, it just felt like 10 times lighter, you know? So it's interesting where we can go through these periods to, to get back to the original point of feeling like we're fine and we don't have any issues, but actually deep within us, there are these traumas that are just waiting to come out at some other point in life. So yeah, that's that's been my own journey, I guess, with the trauma. Thank you for being so open about this. No problem. That's a powerful question. What if you just turned down your fear? Yeah. What other insights did you have from the from the therapist, psychosexual therapist, psychosexual therapist? Um, I mean, it's the same thing. Like it's the same thing as, as a, this therapist I'm seeing now is a yeah. different therapist, and uh, it's the same thing. Which is like maybe it's not the outside world, you know? Maybe it's you're worrying about this situation 
that is causing the issues, you know? So maybe if you just stop worrying, then there's no more issues. It's like overthinking, you know, kind of, it's all this questioning that becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, and it's actually the same to the, the silent retreat I did post, post burnout, starting unplugged. Uh, it was a, it was called intro to Buddhism. So it was half meditation, half Buddhist philosophy. And, uh, it was the same thing, which is like, you know, the, the kind of core idea of Buddhism is that like all of the suffering, all of our suffering comes from ourself, right? Like not the outside world. Like we think you know, most people, most of us, most of the time think that the issue is our boss or, you know, this person or this thing. And actually that is not the issue. The issue is how you react to it. And so like, again, that's a very empowering idea because if it's like, Hey, maybe I'm the problem here. And you do that in a kind way, right? You're not like, damn you, Ali, you know, <laughs> you're the problem here. It's like, uh, or Hector. Um, it's like, the problem is me, but that's good. It means like I can work on it, you know, I can sort it. But yeah, it's super helpful. Like, I think having someone point that out to you, because I think we are just, you know, we all have blind spots all of the time. And, you know, you look back, I think it's so interesting to look back at yourself a few years ago. You're like, wow, I've learned so much. But then if we look forward a few years, we're like, oh no, but I'm probably not going to learn. Like, I probably don't know most yeah. of it now. Yeah. But it'll be the same again, for sure. Yeah. The end of history illusion. <laughs> where we think, oh, I've changed a lot in the last yeah. five years. But like, like, surely, surely I'm at my final evolution. Like, there's no way I'm going to change that much in the next five years. Like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of where I'm, I, need, I need to be. So was there a specific moment where, when you were a teenager that you can, that you sort of trace back to where kind of these insecurities and the fears stemmed from? It's a very deep question. Um, it's a deep dive. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I'm honest, it was just like a, like a, a feeling like, I'm sure there were lots of like little occasions, but it was just a, a real like lacking of self-confidence there and just like not feeling like I knew, so, you know, when people started dating all of that kind of thing, just like not even know where to start with that, you know? So it wasn't like a flirty kid or teenager and like, just didn't know how to, uh, do that to be honest. And I think was kind of maybe like later going through puberty, et cetera. So I was like tiny until the age of about 15. And so I, I just think it all compounded in, but you know, on, on one hand, I had this real self-confidence in myself in some areas. But then on the other hand, I just had this real, uh, uh, yeah, just, just like not being comfortable in my own skin and just like not really knowing you know, how to engage with dating and relationships, et cetera. And you felt like the people around you knew how to do that stuff. Yeah. 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 felt like everyone else had it figured out and I was clueless. Yeah. Do you think that that was true? If... I don't think that was true in hindsight, but only the only time I haven't thought that was true is when you just asked me that. Okay. I, I've never reflected back and been like, Hey, that probably wasn't true, but, mm. but it took you to ask, ask that question to come to that conclusion. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, a lot of occasions where, yeah, it was like where, where, you know, I do, I do, I do this a lot. I'll, I'll tell myself a story about something and it's only like ages later that I'm like, if someone asked the question, I'm like, hang on, that story that I was telling myself perhaps wasn't true. Yeah. Um, like I remember one time, so my brother and I have a podcast that we sort of pseudo do some of the time. And we, we, at, at one point we interviewed one of my friends, his name is Jake. He's like classic lad, like muscles, football team, drinking a lot, you know, the, the stereotype of like, you know, a lot. I mean, he was also a Cambridge medical student. So it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's like, you know, levels of lad. And we were interviewing him about what it's like to be a lad. Because my brother and I were like oh. massive nerds, and we just never had experienced this. And it was qu it was quite like it was quite eye opening because he was like, yeah, I mean, you know, he felt insecure as well in parties, thinking that like everyone else knew knew and had it figured out. And he was like, he would be like, yeah, you know, if I just drink more, then uh, <laughs> then then I'll have a good time. And he it, this was sort of many years after we all graduated from university, and he he said that. He, he he has since spoken to friends from that time of his life who he felt were laddier than he was. And he realized that they were all insecure about yeah. how laddy they were and whether they were truly having fun, but like going along with it because it's what everyone did. Yeah. And when you're in the moment, it's so easy to, yeah, it's so easy to just think that everyone else has it figured out and I'm the problem with me kind of thing. Yeah. I think, I think you would, if you looked hard enough, you would find insecurity at the 
the root of most things, you know, like that little, even, you know, what you perhaps challenge on and, and, and me, um, on the kind of views thing on YouTube. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think every entrepreneur probably does have some insecurity in them still somewhere. Uh, and you know, maybe you need, I listen to, I don't know if you listen to James Watt and Steve Bartlett's podcast. Oh, no, I haven't listened to that one yet. Really interesting. He spoke about how he has this voice permanently on his shoulder telling him he's not good enough, you know, for, which came from his mother. But, mm. uh, and yeah, that, that's an extreme example. Elon Musk, another extreme example, you know, like tough relationship with his father, bullied at school, all that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, sometimes I do think you need that just level of needing to prove yourself to go and do the like really you know outsized things you know like the the kind of napoleons and the elon Musk of the world right like, yeah. i do think i do think you can build something big impactful etc cetera, etc cetera, um from a positive place as well mm. but i think the real outliers there probably is there probably is some insecurity deep at the mm. deep at the core or some kind of pain that's driving us yeah careful what you wish for you know like elon as well is famous for saying I'm not sure you'd want to be me, you know. It's like it's not so great. Yeah, I wonder. Like as as we were talking about kind of views and revenue numbers and stuff, I, I was I was thinking of like I think we all, and I certainly do. We we all peg our self worth to certain things. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for me, growing up. I fully pegged my self worth to my grades and my ranking of the year group. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I I, yeah. you know, I couldn't compete on the uh, lad front or a sports teams front. So it's like, great, you know, I am the guy who comes top of the year academically, and my entire self worth was sort of pegged to that. And then at university, I realized, oh shit, like <laughs> it, it would be a lot of work to continue to peg my self worth of my self worth to that, and uh, it's not really working anymore. And so. Of that insecurity of feeling probably, probably feeling, and in fact, I can just drop the probably, that insecurity of feeling not good enough, not worthy enough to be accepted is what prompted me to start my first business at university. I mean, I started it because I got scammed out of a thousand pounds and I needed to make a thousand pounds back. Once I made the thousand pounds back, yeah, then the next 10 and the next 100 and the next whatever, that was a sense of like, Oh, I might not be the smartest person in the year group or the well, the one with the best grades, but I'm doing business on the side. Check it out. <laughs> and five years later, that morphs into the YouTube channel where all of a sudden this is like a whole other game to play where it's sort of chasing like yeah. daily dopamine hits of self-worth and self-validation and self-like affirmation almost where it's like every new subscriber is a new boost to the ego. Every new viewer is a boost to the ego. Every comment being like, oh my God, I love you. You've changed my life is a boost to the ego. Every comment that's, this is terrible. What, what are you talking about? It's like a massive like, so and it's like there's a lot of, you know, when thing when things are going well and the numbers are going up and the line is going up, then it's very easy to think that like, I'm a I'm a chill guy. I've read all the stoicism books, life is good. <laughs> yeah, but it's when the numbers start to go down that truly tests that 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 thing that Peter that Peter Crone would say. It reveals where you're not free. Yeah. And I found all my first business where, you know, I used to run courses for medical admissions. For the first three years, the numbers kept going up and I felt like on top of the world. And then year four, the numbers plateaued and then year five, they went down a bit. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and that was, you know, led to a lot of journaling and reflection. And that's why I started my blog. And I think my very first post on that blog is like trying to come to terms with the fact that the numbers are going down and deciding what I want to do about it, which was ultimately what prompted the YouTube channel to start. But I think... Yeah, I think we all peg our, I, I, I certainly do, and I, I wonder if people listening to this can relate, but pegging our self-worth to certain numbers and certain things. Yeah, and I think to bring it right back, that's probably one of the many uh, issues, I would say, that, that phones cause, right? It's like, it's that on steroids, Ooh, yeah. yeah, because it is challenging your self-worth all day, every day, you know? Like even the people-pleasing thing we mentioned earlier, like I think you and I are probably quite similar where we have this narrative in our mind that like we're a nice guy. Yeah. And so you feel like if you're not Mate. fine to this person, this challenge your self worth, you know. Yeah. Um and you know, the again it comes back to the overstimulation where there's just too much going on. So that it's just it's just pulling away at us bits mm. and bits. 
Have you read No More Mr. Nice Guy? I haven't, no. It's really good. You would love it. Yeah, okay, so Peter Crone plus No More Mr. Nice Guy. You would fully <laughs> highlight the shit out of that. that like, that's it. so good. <laughs> I, I, I first read it like 10 years ago, and I've reread it every few years since. And every time I've taken so much away from it because it's like, oh, I, I, I'm still fundamentally trying to people please. Yeah. Because there is some sort of insecurity in me that's like, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. Why would anyone accept me as I am? I have to perform to be liked and craving being liked is like a core part of like what I want. Yeah. Yeah. And so whether it's at being at university or being a, being a doctor or being a YouTuber or being in a relationship, there's like so many instances of life where for me at least the the people pleasing tendency comes up in running the team where it's like, I don't want to give negative feedback to someone because I don't want them to think to dislike me for that one moment. Yeah. And then six months later, it's like, fuck, I wish I'd told them and told them this because they could have changed something. And they're like, yeah, yeah. how the hell did you tell me? I'm like, because I want it to be a nice guy. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. It's all, yeah. It all comes down to the, down to the freedom. Um, you said you, so, so this silent retreat, mm. what, so you, so you said it was partly introduction to Buddhism, partly meditation. What was the, so like, it, did you have any experience of this sort of stuff before? Or was that your first experience? And what was, what was, what was that experience like? Yeah, for sure. So I guess to take it back further, uh, during my time, so again, used to kind of drink a lot, not take life too seriously, got a job at this startup. And that was actually a very transformational experience because for the first time, started to like engage with something. I was pretty rubbish at all the jobs I was doing. I was like, did sales for a year, ran product for a year, ran growth for a year. And I was like, I was pretty bad at each job, but I think I was quite good in the startup environment. You know, it was like quite good at navigating the people, said something bright occasionally. So I think that was very engaging. And then it just started to become this like bigger and bigger conflict, this kind of on one, on one side, living this like, you know, kind of boozy lifestyle. Uh, and on the other side, I was like, actually starting to like enjoy something and engage with something, mm. and to start to you know, read a lot more, uh, start to listen to podcasts, all that kind of thing, and, and that introduced me to meditation. And it was like, well, it, I just had it come up again and again and again. Like everyone's like, you know, all these people who seem to have it figured out is like, oh, they also meditate. So I was like, okay, this is probably something worth trying. Did Headspace for a while, um, which I think is a great intro to meditation, but I found. It's quite hard work. Like it's, uh, you know, the focus on the breath. I found, you know, for one month it would go well and then I'd kind of be a bit lazier with a month. And for all of the people who talk about meditation, it's it's actually quite rare to have as a daily practice. Um, people actually do it every day. And, and then I came across something called Transcendental Meditation in summer 2019. And that was, it, it's, it's very big in like Hollywood, you know, so people like Hugh Jackman and Ellen and all these kind of people. And it was like, if the busiest people, if it works for them, then maybe it's worth trying. So I learned that there's a four day induction, went to an unmarked house in Shepherd's Bush. You have to bring a flower, a white handkerchief and a piece of fruit. So it's, it feels a little bit culty, but then you get given a, a mantra, basically a meaningless mantra. And, uh, and that's it. And you just sit there for 20 minutes, twice a day, just repeating this mantra to yourself. And that was completely transformative. That's so, uh, <clears throat> that sounds yeah, well, I mean, yeah. the the main reason is because it's really easy to make it stick. And the reason behind that is just, so all of this Buddhist mindfulness meditation is designed for monastic living, so life in a monastery, right? Sure. So it's quite hard work by by its nature, whereas this is designed for, for lay people. Mm. And so it's just much easier to, to make a habit of it. And if you do any kind of meditation, 20 minutes twice a day, but then what this does is it like lulls you into this state of relaxation. So I don't know, it was just like really, I really vividly remember that first week just being like, oh my God, you know, 90% of the work I'm doing is absolutely nonsense, basically. Like, so, so it just really gave me a lot of clarity on life. Wait, so, just by repeating this mantra to yourself for 20 minutes twice a day? Yeah, by meditating, tw doing this mantra 20 minutes twice a day. So what does that look like? Like if you were to sort of pseudo coach me, like I've never done this before. Like what, yeah. what would it look like if you were to talk me or whoever's listening through? Through actually doing the meditation? Yeah, for like, I don't know, two minutes or something like that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So the, I, I can't give you my mantra because it's yeah. a secret. Yeah, apparently because, you're not yeah. allowed to tell. Yeah, and the reason behind that is if I'm then meditating later, I'll remember this conversation, sure. you know, when okay. I'm saying the mantra. So, okay. uh, so should we make one up? Let's say Om. Let's like say Om. Om, okay. Om is, my symbol. Om is like a, sta a classic one, isn't Om it? Om is a classic one. It's yeah. a classic one, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. It's something to do, the words they choose is something to do with like the vibrations, like you can feel the resonance, if that's the right word, in yeah. your body. So it's something about that. Okay. And uh, so you, 
what you're literally just doing is you're literally just sitting there and okay. literally just I'm close repeating. Just, yeah, close your eyes. Okay, I'm going to close my eyes. And just think to yourself, on. And just think that for two minutes. And if you lose the mantra, then don't worry. When you realize, then you just start doing it again. So I'm just thinking on to myself. That's it. For like two minutes. That's it. And don't try too hard to concentrate on it. Okay. Okay, we're just going to try this out, actually. Like <laughs> Two minutes. That's good. Two minutes. Cool. Still. My phone is still registering an outdoor walk. Oh, apparently I've walked for two hours. <laughs> okay, on for two minutes. That was that was interesting, but it's I, I don't know how you found it compared to like focus on your breath meditation. But it's more of like a more like a nap than a not saying you actually fall asleep. But it's like you're kind of lulling yourself into this state of relaxation. Yeah, rather than like the hard work of of focusing on your breath. Yeah, I did find it was easier because yeah. I was just like um mom 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 yeah whereas when the focus on breath thing I've tried it a few times and it's like quite a lot of mental effort to like really focus on the breath and the sort of rising and falling of the chest and all that stuff yeah and they, they do very different things to the mind so meditation is effectively a tool right it's like all the different types of meditation and different tools so I mean you know I'm sure you know a ton about neuroplasticity and how the brain changes but you can imagine and it comes back to scrolling on your phone right but you can imagine what focusing on your breath does versus that where it kind of lulls you into the state state of rest and it's doing very different things to the mind likewise visualization is another type of meditation or like you know something called analytic med- analytical meditation when you're like focusing on different points in your body so all doing very different things and but fundamentally what they're all helping helping you do is like become more present become more balanced uh and you know just get a better control of yourself and your emotions versus scrolling on your phone for five hours you know you can imagine what scrolling through social media is doing to our mind so i think that is another huge thing we underestimate which is everything you do during the day is a vote on where you want your mind to go and you're moving yourself in that direction and we've just slipped especially with covid we've just kind of slipped into this habit of just like always always switching switching between devices and just it's, it's a much shallower uh, just way of living. I am delighted to say that this podcast is very kindly sponsored by 80,000 Hours. And 80,000 Hours is one of my favorite organizations in the world. They are a nonprofit that helps people have a more positive impact with their career. And the reason they're called 80,000 Hours is because a career is on average 80,000 hours long. It's around 40 hours a week for 50 weeks a year for around 40 years, which adds up to 80,000 hours. That's a very, very, very long time. And so the objective of 80,000 Hours is to help you find a fulfilling career that also has a positive impact in the world. And the best part is they're a complete nonprofit. They are not trying to make any more Money from this at all. And so the organization is sick. I've interviewed a bunch of their members here on this podcast, and they've literally spent the last decade conducting a bunch of research around what makes a career fulfilling and also what makes a career positively impactful on the world. They've been doing this research alongside academics at places like Oxford University. And actually, for me personally, when I was struggling to figure out what to do with my career, I basically binged every single post on 80,000hours.org, which is the website. And I also had a careers counseling session with one of their careers counselors. And those two things, just like reading all this stuff, understanding what are the factors that actually lead to an impactful career, and how can I combine those with my own personal passions and skills really helped me to formulate that actually this career as being a quote thought leader, YouTuber, podcaster, whatever I'm doing now actually felt more meaningful and impactful for me than continuing to be a doctor. So yeah, everything they provide is completely free. They're a nonprofit and their only aim is to help you find a fulfilling and impactful career. And if you want to get a completely free copy of their in-depth career guide, then head over to 80,000hours.org forward slash deep dive. And if you enter your email over there, again, completely for free, they're not trying to make any money from this. If you enter your email, they will send you the career guide, which is basically the crash course in the main ideas that make for a fulfilling and high impact career. So head to 80,000hours.org. That's eight zero. 000 hours h-o-u-r-s dot org forward slash deep dive and that will give you so much more information on how to start planning or changing your, your career to something that's fulfilling and meaningful and has a positive impact on the world so thank you so much eighty thousand hours for very kindly sponsoring this episode while i was saying the oms there were some just thoughts coming up and some other instances where you know that conversation we were having about people pleasing where i realized like two very specific instances where in the last well one of them was like yesterday the other one was like a year ago that I just hadn't really thought about. This came to mind where I was like, yeah, in, in that situation, I was people pleasing and didn't operate doing what I authentically wanted to do. And instead, what I thought a quote nice guy or a quote good man would do in that context, which is sacrifice my own preferences for the 
perceived preferences of someone else. For sure, yeah. I, yeah. Because I think that's it. It's about like also just developing our self awareness, right? I think we are so unself aware by default. And you know, especially when we have this overstimulated mind, we're really not present, right? Like when you're on your phone, you're thinking, you're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about that person whose social media post you've just seen or yep. that person who's messaged you. Um, so you're, you're very not tuned into yourself. And I think it's by tuning into yourself, which obviously meditation is a great way of doing, but really any time offline that you can start to come up with these things and you can start to better answer, you know, that question around like how are you really how are you really doing mm. and, like things start to come up yeah yeah because i guess th this morning as well like i generally i generally make it a point not to check my phone first thing in the morning because it's just such, such good and standard advice but this morning i was like you know last night i was listening to an alex hormozy talk which is like an hour and a half long and i was like you know what that was really good i'm going to continue listening to it and then a friend messaged me that a link to that same talk saying skip to timestamp 32 minutes because this is so you and I was like, cool, let's go. After 32 minutes, listen to it at double speed, realized, oh yeah, this is me in the business. And it's like, yeah. suddenly I'm like, all right, you know, got the AirPods in, going to the toilet, brushing my teeth. And I'm like, yeah, listening at double speed and have all these thoughts coming in my mind around like, all right, cool, interesting things we can do in the business. And then I think, you know what, I'm going to go for a walk to you know, get the morning sunlight in to, you know, as Andrew Huberman would, would recommend, yeah. you know, walk down to the local Pret-a-Manger, get some, you know, I, I get a cheeky coffee. But on the walk, I'm listening to an online course that I'm taking at double speed because I'm like, oh, more stuff, more stuff in the business. Like, yes. Yeah. And just like actually taking the space to, it, 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 it feels so, okay. People are going, it just feels so unproductive to yeah. not, to not to be doing 100%. that. It feels so unproductive to just sit there yeah. for 20 minutes. FOMO, right? It's like, oh, I yeah. need to listen to this talk. Right? I, I could be missing thing. out on yeah. this like value that's just been uploaded to YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And I think that is the key point is like, that is very tangible value, right? Listen to an Alex or Moses talk. Exactly. You're going to get some great insights, right? What is not tangible is the value of going for a walk and not listening to anything, you know, because, you know, it, it's much less certain that there's like two modes of thinking. There's focus thinking, diffuse thinking. I'm sure you've come across this in your travels, but Focus thinking is the spotlight. So the Alex or Mosey talk, you're you're thinking about what he is saying. Yeah. Um, but actually where the magic really happens is diffuse thinking. And it's when you switch off the conscious mind mm. and you do something like go for a stroll, you've got the kind of light, uh, you know, the light movement that's keeping us a little bit engaged, but we don't have to think too much about it. You've got the blood flowing to the brain. And it allows our subconscious mind to start just drawing interesting ideas, which is why when you go for a, a long walk with with nothing. You know, ideas just pop up. You didn't even know. You didn't even know you were thinking about that problem, right? And, and a solution just pops up. Mm -hmm. So I think we, yeah, could benefit a huge amount from spending more time in in that state. And I think most people are never really in that state. Like, you know, this day and age, especially generation, probably a generation younger than than you and me, um, like n never just like sits and thinks, right? Or like, like you know. You look at the tube, like no one's just sat there with their thoughts. And if, if they are, you're like, what's wrong with that person? You know, yeah. everyone's just like sat playing Candy Crush or you know, scrolling through TikTok or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I, I, I don't, but I'm reading and like, is that kind of the same where it's obviously not as overstimulating and I'm a huge fan of reading, but it's, it's the same thing as your podcast where it's like, oh God, you know, I need to cram in. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, I need to finish this book this week or whatever it is. And like, yeah. there is just this kind of productivity porn. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's only when you take all of that away that you realize what's lost. Okay. So you got into transcendental meditation pre silent retreat. Yeah. But you were sort of on and off with it. No, so or that just stuck. Okay. Completely. And I've been doing it for three, no, about four years now. Okay. Nice. And this was pre burnout experience. So this was around the time. That okay, yeah. Actually, the burnout was like that. I, I'm not a kind of high stress guy usually, but like I was stressed out that month. I was going through one of my short two month relationships, and like yeah. that really ramps up the pressure for me. And so I was just like feeling stressed, and I was like, I, I need to crack this, and that's what actually led me to transcendental meditation. Um, so it was like those few months, and then uh, learned that. But then I was still, you know, still the big nights. Like I went on some. Uh, you know, lads, golfing weekend ended up being incredibly heavy and, you know, it took me and one guy turned up. We're like, great, we've got, you know, alcohol, but um, I'm glad we're not doing any drugs this weekend because I, I uh, probably dabbled a little bit too heavily in those back in the day. And 
then the third guy turned up with just like every drug imaginable and just had this very big night which ended up taking acid at six in the morning and i'd never taken acid before at that point take some other psychedelics but not acid and i just spent the next 16 hours just lying in bed staring at the ceiling thinking to myself like what the, what the fuck are you doing with your life man like what are you doing and uh that was a big moment that was about two weeks before i was already booked to go on the silent retreat but that was about two weeks before so by the time i got there i was just like okay whew, i am out of all of that yeah. crap uh and yeah so it was, it was a lot of things like compounding and uh it did feel like a bit of a breaking point um which yeah i probably didn't admit at the time but uh so like, yeah you know, it's fine i'll just get the him and that is and but i really needed that i needed needed that break been like building up for a decade really so you went on the silent retreat yes what happened next what happened next so it was yeah as i mentioned this buddhist temple on top of a mountain it was actually just outside dharamshala which is where the dalai lama lived so I went down to see him one of the days not not one-on-one though one. it was a big event but uh the the retreat itself again was half buddhist philosophy half meditation so it was about it was silent so it was about four hours a day meditating and about four hours a day buddhist teaching but i think i went into it i would say uh just like very like naive and skeptical of religion like very much like you know obviously it's wrong quote unquote and uh i think that was a real eye-opener i i i I mean i wouldn't particularly identify with the religion now but i'd say i appreciate the role it plays in society much more so the the buddhist philosophy the first four or five days it was like yeah you know interesting but not life-changing and then halfway through the retreat we got into the buddhist idea of attachment which is like i need this to be happy and that was just like mind blown it explained all of the you know things that had led me there and all the things going on in my life at the moment like one of the big questions i was grappling with was like should i go and try and do an mba somewhere which is a silly question hindsight and it was just like and I spent the first four or five days just like journaling on that, like, oh, should I should do it, you know, pros and cons, I'm enjoying the current place, but like, yeah, that would help me like step up a gear. And then I heard that and it was just like, it doesn't matter, you know, I don't need it either way, you know? Um, and so, so that was really, that was really empowering. Like that was exactly what I needed to hear. And then towards the end of the retreat, the last two days of like intense meditation. So you spent like six or seven hours a day meditating it's a lot of visualization so like one of them for example is you spend 20 minutes focusing on your breath and then 20 minutes you have this guided meditation with that telling you to imagine yourself in the ground so you're imagining yourself in your grave and you're rotting and you know worms are crawling in and out of you and that that you you come out of that just feeling like i don't think i've ever felt so alive as when you come out of that and you've just spent 20 minutes like properly meditating on your on your death so, so that was very eye-opening. And then there was a lot of compassion stuff as well, which I think is super, I think compassion is underrated. Like if you can turn up with unconditional compassion each day at work with your family, then that just kind of transcends everything else. You know, if you, like any other crap, if you can actually just operate from a place of full compassion, which obviously is hard in practice, easy in theory, then, you know, everything else is really, you know, just a detail. So that was i think that was the big thing from that retreat i've actually done another one since which was different something called a vipassana which is like eight or nine i was actually 10 hours a day meditating i did that earlier this year and that was a very intense experience more about just like really so so that's where you're like focusing on the sensations within yourself right and like that retreat really felt like work but but this one this initial one i came out of that just like buzzing just like feeling so much joy and compassion um, and that that glow lasted for months or even a year afterwards. I, I think, you know, definitely some permanent changes off the back of that. Like it, it changed my perspective about a lot of things. Okay, like what? Well, that I need this or that to be happy was the big one. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it was just that kind of empowering. Like I said, up until that point in my life, I just had this like, I just wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And it was just this feeling of... Um, really caring what people think and that just completely disappeared and you know obviously it's come back to some extent which is what we spoke about the people pleasing earlier but i think it was this like oh, i can just go and, and do whatever so i mean I, I got back from that retreat um no intention to quit my job but then so we were trying to raise a 10 million pound funding rounds i had to come back for a, a leadership meeting and two days into that the money fell through we're losing three hundred thousand a month 
And so that night we fired half the company, closed the US office, closed the Australian office. I was running marketing at the time, running growth, and we paused all growth spend. So I just had a week twiddling my thumbs uh, and then had been thinking a lot about like digital detoxing and my own phone use, had heard about this like cabin movement and just sat there on a Friday night and just thought, what about that cabin idea? Um, spent three hours Googling cabins and was like, this will probably work. And then quit on Monday. And I think a lot of that was just really feeling empowered of like, you can just go and do anything, you know? I had no idea how we were going to do it, but it was like, yeah, why not? You know, why not go and give this a try? Okay. Good question before we go into the cabins thing. Um, you said that one of the big life-changing realizations was this whole attachment thing. People hear that all the time. That like, oh, just don't be attached to things. And like, you know, the idea of non-attachment and like, you know, letting things go. There are even Disney songs about that. <laughs> so what, what was it about the experience of doing it on a silent meditation retreat in the Himalayas in a Buddhist temple that made you feel the truth of that idea in a way that just hearing it on a podcast might not have done? That's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, you, you're putting in the work there. So you're going, you're, you're meditating and, you know, you have hours and hours and hours to reflect on these things, right? Like it's a silent retreat. You know, there's nothing else you can do apart from reflect on these things. And I think you need that. You need to like be present with yourself and like it's building that self-awareness in yourself so you can recognize it, right? Because if you just hear that, you think, oh yeah, it's a smart idea, but whatever. But if you're like really tuned into yourself, then when you hear that, it's like you're then kind of coupling that up with how you're feeling and what's been driving you the last few days. And you're like, oh my God, that's exactly what has been happening to me these last few days when I've been like thinking about this MBA or whatever it is. And so it's that kind of experience of really seeing it in yourself, like vividly in that moment. And, and you know, that requires the being offline and not being, not thinking about all these people who WhatsApp to you. It requires really tuning in with yourself and like actually figuring out what your own experience is, you know? So it's learning by experience and you need the whole retreat and the meditation and all that kind of thing to intuitively know it. I think where I was in my life, I think people could go to that retreat and not come away with that realization and maybe come away with some different ones that I didn't have. So I think a lot of it was like, that was where I was in my life when like, that was causing me a lot of you know grief and suffering. Um, and so the, cause interesting, I did this other retreat earlier this year, much more intense experience. And I think I, I, I'll be honest, I came out of that a little disappointed, mm -hmm. a little shaken as well. There's a lot of meditating and it's physically tough as well. Um, but I came out of that like a bit disappointed because I had this sky high expectation because the last retreat I did was so life changing. Um, so I, I do think where you are in life has a huge, it's, it's like anything. It's like what we read, you know, what we listen to, like you as a person, where you are in your life. You could read one book and not really do anything, and then you could read the same book in a year and it yeah. completely change your life. Or, or you know, likewise, it's, it's why giving book recommendations is sometimes difficult because it's like I've given that, been like, I'm sure you're going to love this book, and then the person's like, no, nah, didn't do anything for me. So it's it, you know, it's very uh, dependent on the situation and where you are. Um, but I think the what's interesting is just exposing yourself to the right kind of things, you know. So a Buddhist retreat is a place where you're quite likely to have these realizations, getting offline, out into nature, reading books. Like these are the kind of things where you're like increasing the chances of that serendipity occurring. If you're spending 10 hours a day scrolling through TikTok, you're probably not going to have those realizations. So it's about doing the right things. Like you're not sure where the, um, what's going to come out when, but it's kind of like what the trauma we spoke about earlier. Yeah. But it's like, if you can do the right kind of work, then you know things will come up and just be patient, trust the process and. Yeah, do the work, I guess. Mm. Yeah, as you were as you were describing that, it, it sort of got me thinking around how you know just to to use like a just a business example, uh, you know, taking a step back from the day to day running of the business and going on an offsite with the team with the leadership team and sort of mapping out the strategy and listing down all the issues and drawing the org chart and like doing all the all the stuff, figuring out what's our annual goal and things like that. And that's stuff that you just don't have time and space to do normally. And it requires an active concerted effort to get quote off the grid, like unplug from the day to day running of the business, being in the business to think about zooming out and working on the business. And then in those contexts, whenever we've done that, A, we've always just had like loads of realizations that, oh, wow, this is the thing we should be doing. But when those days have been facilitated by a coach, they've been like some of the best days of my life because it's just like so 
thrilling and exhilarating actually thinking about this stuff, really unpacking it. And then the coach just says one little thing, <laughs> one little thing like, what's the 20% of actions that are driving 80% of the results? And suddenly it's like, oh my God, my fucking <laughs> mind is blown. But like, obviously I know the Pareto print, like obviously, like, yeah. I, you know, as I read it a zillion times over, it's like, I asked what are the 20% of input, like, what's the 80, 20 here? It's like, yeah, yeah it's kind of like meaningless. But in the, in the context on an offsite with a flip chart, and like loads of papers thrown around. We've spent the last like 12 hours and or two days thinking about this thing and unpacking everything in the business. That question from an experienced person who has been through the process before just asks you, what are the 20% of things that are driving all the results? You're like, okay, I get it now. I understand. And you feel it. And then you cut 80% of the things in the business and the business grows. And it's like, <laughs> but you needed that time and space yeah. to unpack in order to, in order for that realization to make sense. And yeah. that was the sort of image that came to mind as you were describing that, like, you need, like you might have heard, you know, just don't worry about things. <laughs> and it's like, what's that going to do? But if you spent five days reflecting and unpacking stuff, you've got all the paper, all the papers out, and now you're here. But if you just don't worry about it so much, oh, yeah. now all of a sudden it's like, I get it, hundred percent. Yeah, I think that's it. It's like, you know, it's getting to the truth of the situation. You know, like the work is understanding what's really going going on here. Like once you get to that place, then what you should do is like straightforward. But that's the hard place to get to. You know, like to see the forest for the trees, right? We spend all of our days just like in the weeds and it's taking the time, zooming out, both both for a company and ourselves, right? I, I do think, yeah, obviously you compare the two and, and they are they are comparable. You know, it's the same it's the same stuff. Like we're all running our own little companies uh, each day. And exactly. It's uh it, it's really understanding like what's actually going on. And that is much deeper than we think. Like we have no idea really what's happening in us most of the time. Like we, we know so little about the human body. We're learning about it. We know even less about the mind. Um, but, you know, you can you can kind of just tune into your experience and and the more you understand what's actually going on, if like if you really knew, let's let's say someone has some, you know, very disturbing trauma and it shows up as just anger their whole life. It's until they know that this trauma caused that. Mm then you know it's not obvious what the path forward is right it's just like i'm an angry person you know shows up again and again and again and again and it's really not obvious it's it's like how would you know what to do but then if suddenly one day they find out that actually it's linked to this one thing that happened to them when they're a teenager then suddenly it's obvious it's like all right well i need to cure that thing and then the problem will go away so it's really about spending the time like you know ideas are cheap wisdom is or yeah there's a great phrase beware of wisdom not earned i think that's so applicable because like you know you you can all of the wisdom is is there all of the wisdom other people's wisdom is there for us to to do it but what to implement and where to implement how to implement that requires us to to really understand ourselves or our company mm. beware of wisdom not earned yeah that's really nice that also reminds me of something i've been been, been thinking about recently which when it comes to just somewhat tangentially reading some people will say like oh books are pointless because you can just read a summary or you can just watch a video or oh this could have been a blog post but a blog post that summarizes the top 10 insights from i don't know atomic habits or you know from siddhartha or from the well like whatever spiritual text yeah. you want it's not it's, it's not going to do anything that's unearned <laughs> wisdom and you kind of need even just in reading you need the fluff you need the stories the stuff that doesn't actually seemingly add value to the main pithy highlightable tweetable takeaway yeah you need it to understand the, the the takeaway and if you don't have that you just get a list of a list of pithy quotes that like sound nice on the surface you're like yeah and you just don't take any action on that 100 percent. i think i think biographies are a great example of that because you can mm -hmm. learn so much by reading about you know people who have gone on to do impactful things or whatever and you know it, it's if you read a long biography it might take i don't know 15 20 hours and it's that time you're spending sitting with that person and really understanding them through every situation yeah and you know just building the idea of that character in the mind and then you know as you say you really understand why they have done something you have the context around it yeah. but you are also spending that time like your mind is working all the time you're reading your mind is kind of pondering in the background like making connections etc yeah and so like that is the time where you're earning what you then take away from the book and so i think yeah this we have this um 
attitude of just like instant instant results you know yeah. and of course you, you need to put in the time and so i think the process of reading a book is uh you know is super valuable it, it really helps kind of again just develop concentration and yeah but i i started reading a lot about three or four years ago didn't read that much before that and you know con concentration's massively improved and like the amount i can read has massively improved and i, I think that is a great muscle to build because it, again it just calms you down makes you more present and just allows you to think deeper about things yeah yeah, I realized I was about, I was about to make the, that mistake this morning where I was listening. <laughs> I was listening to this online course and I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's like 50 hours of training from this guy who's literally sort of playing the same game as I am, but just like two levels above. And it's like, yeah, ah, 50 hours of training. Like, could I just put it through like a, you know, I was thinking I'll download the MP3, put it through ChatGPT, get the transcription, <laughs> no. get the summary. I was like, I'll take the actionable points away. That's just a dumb way of thinking about it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> there's literally this guy who's like open sourced his knowledge. It's literally roughly where I want to be. Like why wouldn't I listen to him for 50 hours and take notes and really think about it and do the work to earn the wisdom rather than just read a summary of the transcript and action and, and the highlightable action points. Yeah, because the, no. the, the other quote that comes to mind is uh, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. You're also the sum of the content you consume, right? Yeah. And when, you are, when you're listening to a content creator for 50 hours, mm. like you're spending 50 hours with that person. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's it's all the little things that kind of trickle out of that that uh, where the value is you know as, as you say not the not the, the one-liner not the one-liner yeah and sometimes the one-liner is the one-liner but 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 but, it, but but it's but it's the one-liner of like oh yeah everything is downstream of lead generation that one-liner makes perfect sense when yeah. you have context exactly but until you have context like, exactly okay cool what's next <laughs> um so cabins cabins you know, yeah. so you said you got back from the side of the tree quit the job and you were thinking about cabins like what was the what was the sure. story yeah so I, I i've been thinking a lot about like digital detoxing read a great book called um digital minimalism by cal newport earlier that year interestingly i uh he talks a lot about unplugged and unplugging and i was like oh unplugged would be a great name for a business this is before i was thinking about cabins so I tried to buy unplugged.com just in case i ever set up a business it cost like a hundred grand so I didn't buy it <laughs> one day <laughs> one day yeah and uh so, so that had been on my mind and then obviously went to the silent retreat which which further reinforced it um and had heard about this like cabin movement and i think what's a cabin so there's like a kind of tiny house movement and you know oh, yeah. there's lots of like cabin concepts in other countries and what's interesting about cabins is they have let's call it sex appeal you know especially in this like instagram world we live in you know it's sexy it's aspirational and i think digital detoxing even the phrase it sounds a bit faddy hmm. so when we were sitting down we can talk a bit about the business in a second but when we were sitting down uh to create unplugged we made a list of phrases we weren't going to use and one of them was digital detox because it like sounds a bit faddy you know? yeah and then after a while we're like well actually this kind of is the thing yeah i was gonna say the world on the website <laughs> it's never <laughs> see the phrase like yeah yeah <laughs> so it's like rather than worrying too much about it why don't we just try and make it cool you know and i think to affect change in this day and age you kind of say with tesla and electric cars mm -hmm. but you have to make it sexy and so i think that's what that's what we thought cabins could bring to the space yeah. so the concept behind unplugged we put cabins an hour or two from city life people go for three days, literally lock their phone in a box. We give them a Mac and a Nokia and leave them to it. So it's really what we are is effectively an experience company where we want people to experience three nights offline in a cabin in nature. What sort of effect does this have? So I did, I didn't know for context, I did one of these last year and didn't actually take it seriously because it's like, and, and, and this is one of the areas where I think my people pleasing tendencies came up because as, as I was doing the OM shit, like a couple of minutes ago, I was thinking. You know, it would be cool to do a, a proper unplugged kind of cabin in the woods retreat thing. Why didn't I do it last time? Oh, last time it's because, you know, my, there was something happening at home and something happening with friends and like something happening with my girlfriend where I was like, oh, uh, you know, uh, I don't really, I, I can always do the cabin another time. It's like, it doesn't need to be this weekend. It's like, my grandma's visiting this weekend and it's like, oh, I should just, you know, and then my brother was like, mate, you can do the unplugged thing anytime. Like, you know, the guy's like, come on. It's like, oh, it was like, okay, fine. Like, why not? It's like, oh, the team wanted to film a video as well. But yeah, I might as well film it while I'm there. And it's like, all of a sudden, this thing just becomes another work thing that I sort of went to the cabin. I drove there, it was 20 minutes away from home, drove back home because we had people coming over, drove back to the cabin to sleep overnight, drove back in the minute. It's just it sort of just became a bit of a hotel room yeah. and completely defeated the purpose of actually doing an unplugged type situation. But that situation came to mind where I was like, I really wanted to do this, but I 
overrode my own preferences for the sake of the perceived preferences of other people, which in the moment might have been the right thing to do because like my grandma was at the stake. But like yeah. that situation played out over over time, I think gets us to a place where, yeah, where That's like, it. Yeah. yeah, I don't value my own preferences enough, possibly. Yeah, well, so, so I think what happens when you mm. do it, so what doesn't happen is you don't change your habits, right? You don't come back and you never check your phone again. You know, you don't, don't change your habits in, in three days. But what does happen is you change your perception. So for most of us, probably in the last decade, we have not spent a day even, or, or definitely not three days off our phones. And so you don't, we, we don't see what we're missing. So when you go and do this, you can lock your phone away. The, the, there's something very empowering just about that moment of actually just locking in a box and being like, oh my God, okay. I'm actually just unreachable from those three days. That's that's kind of cool. And then the the first day, you are actually a little bit anxious because you know you kind of feel like you've lost a limb. But then you just get this like deep sense of calm. And again, that is how we are built to operate. And experiencing that is incredibly powerful. So you know, we get what's really interesting is it feels like it starts people off on that journey, right? So they come and stay with us and experience this, and then spending that time offline and doing this digital detox then makes you crave that more. And so then seeking it out more in your life. Mm -hmm. But not only do you, you kind of change your perception on that, but you also get all the benefits of the kind of deep sense of calm and relaxation. And honestly, you just come back as a better person. Like we, we used to check people in uh, ourselves at the start. We were cleaning the cabins ourselves. And the difference between people when they checked in and checked out was crazy. They looked 10 years younger, which is insane in, th in three days. And so I think, again, it's it's a lot of not knowing just just how much you're carrying until you actually just go and spend that time offline. And so it's really about starting people off on that journey, you know, because at the moment, the momentum is in the direction of spending more time online, yep. you know, and so our goal is to start to move that momentum in another direction. So we have, you know, many people now who come and do this, you know, every six to 12 months. And I think that is really the goal. Like how can we normalize this and make it something people just do like you go to the gym for your physical health, you go and do a digital detox. Yeah, once every three to six months as as part of your mental health. Why? Well, so I was I was I was like singing the praises of this to friends when I first heard about the concept, and when we first met, like a year or eighteen months yeah. ago. And I was like, oh, I mean, what? what I, but I I could just do that at home, or I could just do that in an Airbnb. Why am I going to a slightly bougie cabin in the woods to <laughs> for the sake of just not being on my phone? For sure. So the the key is could but they don't, right? Yeah. So like, this is all about actually getting people to experience it, you know? And the cabin is great for that because it's sexy, because it, you know, it's very tangible, you know? It feels like a whole experience. It's something you can tell your family, you can tell work, like, I am going to spend three nights offline at this cabin. It's this whole thing. And that is what empowers you to do it. Yeah. And then, you know, our job is to then actually have everything there so that you don't need to check your phones. There's a Polaroid, there's a map, there's a Nokia. And so really what we are doing is giving you that time offline in nature, you know, and that is the key. And then once we have achieved that, then you know, the nature and being offline and you yourself do the work, like just being there, it's, you know, you can go and spend three nights offline you don't really have to do whatever you want, but you will destimulate, you'll feel this deep sense of calm. So yeah. our goal is really to get you out there, get you offline. And then just let you let your body, let your mind calm mm. down, and and let nature take its course. Mm. And so, what sort of what, what what sort of stuff do people say after a three night thing? So, like you know, for context, we we've gifted this to everyone in our team, and I think like half the team has done it so far, and everyone's got away from it being like, oh my god, that was so sick. <laughs> but like, what, what what sort of stuff do you hear from people? Yeah, for sure. So I think the like the biggest insight is just like, oh my god, what what why am I so busy? Right, like. Because I think everyone goes into it thinking like the world's going to end if they spend three days offline. And the big insight is like, oh, you actually can just go and do this, you know, which is crazy. So I think people, you know, really feel that sense of um, <clears throat> just just like perspective on their life of like, like, why was I so busy and so crazy? Like whenever I do this, I go away and I'm like, uh, oh my God, like what, what, I just need to do less meetings. Like what, why am I trying to cram in all these meetings? So I think it really helps you give you the tools to go back into your life and just like we'll know what we should be doing more of but like people come out of this with like uh oh i should pick up exercise again or i should start eating healthier again or like whatever it is so i think it's that 
you know, that rest, as you say, uh, as we were talking about earlier, kind of cures that low key burnout and just gets people back in this, back in the driving seat, you know? So like it, it just, what we see is not only the experience has its benefits, but then afterwards, you know, it's what you take back into your life. Uh, and yeah, what what we hear is that a lot of people go back and like will implement so if they're a couple they'll go and like start doing a day a week where they'll go to a restaurant leave their phones at home or that kind of thing so yeah i think that is the that's the nicest thing to see is just like starting people off on that journey yeah nice final question like how how does the business side of this work like what does it like if someone was like you know what i want to start a business where i put cabins in woods and get people <laughs> get like tech bros from in my city to go there for three days like what what is involved in running a business like this for sure so simple in theory uh not so in practice but yeah basically we own and operate the cabins so we kind of work with the company to get them built and then we work with landowners on a revenue share so farms in the states classically again there's a big move for farm diversification there, there also is just a beautiful um you know the, the english countryside is beautiful so that there's a lot of beautiful spots out there so for us we're really about just getting our cabins in these areas and then obviously building a building a brand and really selling people in london ironically on social media yeah um about why they should come and do this and then just getting people to experience it so simple business cabins up and, and then fill them we have 17 cabins now we'll be at 32 by the end of this year starting to spread out across the uk mm. And uh, yeah, it's just amazing to see all the interesting ways people are doing it. As you mentioned with your team, like we have a lot of companies who use this and employ benefit. We have lots of people like you know, gifting it or yeah. making it a regular thing. Yeah, it's a nice gift to give to someone. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So I give you the gift at time of flying. How, how much does it cost to build a cabin? It's about 45,000 all in, so they're expensive. Okay. But then- So if you have a garden, you can just build a, get, get a cabin built in your garden for 45K? Because yeah. these cabins are quite nice. Got like a toilet yeah. with the toilet and the stove and everything. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so that's all in. Yeah, yeah. you can. Uh, I think that's it. I think it's as well. It's like, you know, a lot of people would like to go and spend time in a cabin in the countryside. Yeah, that's a cool thing. Yeah, but yeah. haven't got forty five k lying around. Yeah. So anywhere to put it, all of these things. So it's about making it more accessible. Like in countries like um, Sweden, you know, Scandinavia, they have this culture of summer houses. So yeah, that's what they call summer houses, which are these effectively cabins that that everyone has, and it's just a nice thing to go and do. And I think, especially in London, like, you know, we have millions and millions of people who just spend all of their time in London and don't really have the option to go out. I think yeah. actually post-COVID, people are starting to discover the British countryside more. And like, actually, you know, you can do some pretty amazing things just an hour or two from London. So I think, you know, we also want to bridge that gap. It's like, how do you have all these people who are burnt out and stressed out in the city? And how do we get them offline into nature outside of the city? And cabins are a great way of doing that. Nice. Um, and so we're going to scale up that i think business is a lot about focus and doing one thing really well yeah. and then in the future there might be a you know wider unplugging digital detox play so we will see but exciting times nice um and so for someone so we'll put links in the show notes video description if anyone wants to do this uh mostly they're in and around london so we have a fairly international reach so it probably not relevant for a lot of people but um for someone listening to this who's gotten this far who's like i love the idea of switching off and going to a cabin or something for a few days and all taking my phone, what would be your step-by-step -step guide if, let's say, they're based in, I don't know, somewhere other than England where these cabins are not a thing? Yeah, for sure. So you really want to remove all the reasons you would, all the excuses you would have for checking your phone because that that's what it would be. It will be like, you go with the best intentions and there's like, oh yeah, but I just need to check like the weather or I just need to check, get the map or whatever it is. So if, if you want to go and stay in an Airbnb or whatever it is and leave your phone behind, then you know, get a map of the local area. In, in the UK especially, you can just get an OS map of an area. Um, and that means you can leave your phone behind. You know, get a watch, get an alarm clock, like whatever it is you need. But what I would also say is just start small. You know, you don't need to go and spend three nights in the countryside. Just put your phone in a drawer. Just go for a walk. Just don't take your phone to the shop, for example. Yeah. So I think we, one, we, you know, we try and overcomplicate it. And then we beat ourselves up when we, we do check our phone, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we all kind of, you know, obviously phones are great and we like our phones, but we also kind of hate our phones. We're also like, ah, oh, guys, you know, like it, it does bring a lot of stress into our lives. Yeah. So I think we then kick ourselves, you know, that we spend so much time on it. Like yeah. when I mention what I do to people, they're like, oh my God, yeah, I'm, I'm terrible on my phone. I could never do that. Or I really need that or whatever it is. And I think there's just this narrative 
that we're shackled to our phone and there's nothing we can do. And just just start small, you know, just put your phone in a drawer, just leave it out of the bedroom at night, take half an hour, an hour in the morning, um, and just, just keep just keep plugging away. And you know, if and when you're ready to come to your cabin, then you know, it'll find us. Fantastic. <laughs> Hector, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Ali, great to great to be here. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.